Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Blake Self. This is Deb Delay, like my taco from Surfboard Hackers. I'm glad to see so many people decided to come out. I figured, you know, you put free and anonymous in a name of a speech at DEF CON, probably a lot of people showing up. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Normally, I start out if I'm talking with uh, corporations, you know, a little more serious with you guys. I figure you probably like humor. So I said, uh, you know, what Ted Stevens said, you know, the Internet's a series of tubes. Figured maybe he has a bunch of these hack modems, you know, at his house. Has them all hooked up with a, you know, drop amp, and, and that's why he thought it's a series of tubes. So there's just a little bit of humor for you guys. Um, a little bit about me. Um, did, I was a Cybernet administrator and red team pen test for the United States Marine Corps. I currently do research with the Software Engineering Research Center, which is uh, located uh, main office at Ball State University. It's an NSF, the National Science Foundation Industry University Cooperative Research Center. Um, a much shorter version of this speech was given at the Cirque uh, Showcase. I'd actually planned to give you guys some of the responses of the companies. Unfortunately, um, non-disclosure agreement is standing between that, getting that information to you guys. So uh, with this speech, I had some people like Durandal that have actually taken the methods in this speech and used them. And uh, he's put modems online, kept modems online. Uh, so far, you know, he hasn't, you know, the party van hasn't shown up, so it seems to be going good. Um, what I'm going to go over, and I actually what they're going over as well, we'll start out with some requirements um, for our examples. A network overview, which is the DOCSIS network. Go over anonymous access, cloning, um, how anonymous you really are, basically, like how the ISPs are trying to currently catch people. Uh, firmware overview, and then end with hardware and security. So requirements, what do you need? Well, obviously, we're talking about, uh, you know, you're wanting to get internet access through uh, cable modem ISP, so you've got to have a coax connection to the company. You need a, a JTAG cable, for our example, since we're actually going to be changing the, the firmware on the modems. You can use either a USB or a parallel um, JTAG. Now, I wouldn't recommend the parallel because it's really, really slow. Uh, you need, for these examples, a surfboard 5100 or 5101 cable modem. Uh, other modems can be modified, but just to keep it quick, we only use those two in this, uh, these examples. You need some sol uh, soldering skills and a 10-pin header. YouTube's a great reference if you don't know how to solder. There's a ton of videos on there. You know, you can look up and figure it out. You need uh, applications. They're used for flashing the firmware onto the modem. For the parallel port, uh, JTAG, which I already said is really slow, they have Schwartzcats, which is by TC and ISO, or the USB JTAG, which is a lot faster. I think it takes maybe 10 seconds to flash a modem. Uh, that you can get one of those, uh, the software from usbjtag.com. So requirements in depth, kind of already went over that. Here's some pictures. He's already actually shown the real deal. There's the schematics. If you want to do the parallel port, the, the USB one's a lot more complicated, so I wouldn't really recommend trying to make one of those yourself. I mean, if you can, then you probably, you know, you don't need me to show you how to do it. <laughs> Here's the 5100 is on the left. The 5101 is on the right. Now, you can either crack those open and just solder that 10-pin header right there, or you can, uh, you know, buy a pre-mod. They're all over the place. One of the places is sbhacker.net, which is where these guys are from. You can uh, pick one up fairly cheap, and you program it. This is a, uh, you know, that's pretty much the software right there. I already mentioned those, and then the features of the firmwares we're going over. You can enable factory mode, change all your uh, your associated MAC addresses, change the serial number. You can disable the ISP firmware upgrade, which basically, I mean, if you don't do that, then they could actually, you know, send you a new firmware overwrite your good hack firmware with the factory one, which you don't want. You can disable reboots, so you know they're not rebooting your modem. Force network access is basically, in some cases, you can get an unauthorized message saying, hey, you're not allowed on this network. Well, if that's all they're using to, you know, for security, you can just ignore that. Yeah. <laughs> it's working. It, Force you, network <laughs> access just uh, floods the DHCP server with packets repeatedly until you, uh, get in IP address, HFC mm -hmm. IP, that's all it does. So uh, uh, disable and set ISP filters. Basically, like in some cases, you could have ports that are blocked at the modem level. A lot of times they're actually blocked uh, at the cable modem termination system level, but let's say like 
port 139 is blocked at the modem level where you can remove that. Uh, you can specify a config file name. So let's say you don't like the config you're getting, config being your speed. Well, you can specify a TFTP server and an IP address. Say, hey, use this one instead. Uh, you can basically on the same lines, you can actually download a config file and then actually upload that to the modem's memory and say, hey, you know, don't even bother grabbing one each time, just use this one. And it uses that. You can uh, get and set uh, SNMP OID values and factory mode OID values. You have full Broadcom CLI access through serial connection or telnet. And of course, full shell access to the VXWorks or ECOS uh, Unix-like operating system that's on the modem. And of course, upload flash and upgrade firmware. So you know you need to get a newer version. You can do it fairly easily. Just a little bit. This is a very, very simple diagram of the, the DOCSIS network. So you've got your cable modem termination systems. You've got operation support, which is really, you know, those are the guys you don't want to, you know, see that you're online if you're not supposed to be. You've got your customer database, which is like, you know, your MAC addresses, and then, uh, you know, what speeds go with those MAC addresses, or, and, you know, generally it's a config file, but to make it easy, you could say speeds. Your internet, then you've got all your nodes, which is, uh, you know, basically going out to all the houses. Whoops, let's go back. Okay, so for anonymous internet access, the one we're actually giving like the full like, you know, walkthrough complete, like you could go home and get online anonymously is with Comcast. The reason I chose Comcast, I said, well, according to this uh, ispplanet.com, it's the second most used ISP in the US. It's actually the largest ISP that is uh, DOCSIS. The number one was uh, SBC, which is DSL. On Comcast, if you hook a non-provisioned modem up to the Comcast network, then basically a Comcast page comes up. I don't know if anybody's ever tried that, but you try to go to a website and, hey, welcome to Comcast. You know, you're either a technician or a member. Um, and they want to know, you know, basically, are you just trying to order service or if you're a technician, you can sign up. An interesting thing on a side note, which I don't think it's set up this way anymore, is if you had clicked your technician, you could actually put a little bit of information up and start doing customer lookups without authentication. So you start looking up people's accounts. I, I think they fixed that though, but that was uh, about a year ago. It was like that. Um, you can connect inbound. Like let's say you have a regular modem, you want to connect to it. You can see the IP address it pulled, and you can connect to it. You just seem to not be able to connect out. So if you look, uh, actually, you change the DNS server and you find out, oh wow, the only security they really have keeping me offline is. It gives me this, these bogus DNS servers that tell me every site is, you know, Comcast.net. So you change that to a, a DNS server other than that, and like, hey, well, I can, you know, I can get online. I mean, there was a, a modem I know that Drandall had. It was like the first DOCSIS one certified modem, and hooked it up and was able to get it online just changing the, you know, DNS server. So bam, okay, there you're online. <laughs> Not really even having to modify the firmware, but uh, as we go on, I'll explain why you would, you know, want to change the firmware. If you disable the SNMP filters, then um, you're able to do you know a whole lot of uh, different things like pulling uh, other modems, getting useful information. A uh, big thing I know a lot of people were probably going to be after say, okay, well, I can get online. You know, I went ahead and modified my modem, so you know I want to be faster. You know, of course, because like a bite my taco. That's from his uh, his little thing on the forum it says, uh, don't forget kids, the faster you download, the bigger your penis is. So. <laughs> You know, hey, <laughs> seems to be everybody wants speed. So, um, you know, anonymous access, of course, it's good, but, you know, the faster it is, the better it is. <laughs> I know that's one of the biggest complaints I've heard with Tor is a lot of people are saying, hey, this is, uh, this is really slow. <laughs> you know, how do I get it to go faster? So uh, in order to increase speeds, you can uh, force a faster configuration file from the ISP. Uh, essentially, you're always doing one from the ISP, but it can be from their TFTP server or you can store it. Um, on a local TFTP server, or you can actually flash it to the modem. Um, Comcast uses static instead of dynamic configs, and really what that means is everyone uses the same config. Like, okay, you get the speed, well, then you get this config. It's not like a special configuration file specifically for, you know, your independent modem. Like, let's say you have a 5100. Well, everyone with a 5100 that's on the basic plan gets, you know, the basic 5100 config. So that just makes it a lot easier, you know, especially if you're you know, you don't have to, to mess with a lot of stuff. So here's some example configuration files that Comcast uses. DOCSIS 1, they have the speed tier 2, which I think actually there's a, 
maybe on theory share they might talk about that there's a, a site where uh, people are always seem to refer to that config uh, 16 down two up then you have the showcase which is actually generally the best one uh, is 55 uh, down and five up and then you've got the the na which is unrestricted but an important thing to note is that generally it seems to only pull about 1.5 up even though it if you look in the actual config file you see there's no restriction it, it only pulls that 1.5 generally and then you've got the same on the Doxus 1.1. If you see the D11 um, on the far left, or the D10, that's Doxus 1, Doxus 11, then you have the, the model of modem. And the last part, the C0 whatever dot CM, that, that little end part, that's actually your uh, computer IP addresses. So if it says five, that means you can hook that modem up to a switch and you've got five IP addresses. Five statics versus um, just the one, like on the showcase, it has the one. <coughs> So changing the configuration file, um, here's a, some example pictures. These slideshows also are meant to, basically you can download, you know, it's on the CD and it has the, the URL, you can go and download the slideshow and then kind of have a lot of nice pictures, you know, to walk you through it, make it pretty easy for you to, to work with this stuff. Um, there's just some example pics from Sigma X2, so if you, you know, that's the one you choose to use, then um, those should help you. We have an example from Hacksaware on the 5101. And then the, the better part, techniques for remaining anonymous, is, is really what, I guess it comes down to why, in my mind, you're really changing your firmware. And that's uh, disabling SNMP um, after registration. That's, that's really useful, because basically once your modem gets online, it disables SNMP. And if uh, you've ever looked into, I guess, the Motorola, some of the software they have, like Stormwatch, what some of the ISPs use, saying, hey, let's see what modems are online and what they're doing that software is like 100% dependent on SNMP. So if your modem doesn't, uh, you know, reply on SNMP, then it's kind of like it's not there. And that's one of the, I guess, one of the downfalls sometimes of visualization software is that a lot of times it gives them this pretty picture. You know, you can hire people for a lot less per hour saying, hey, you know, I know you don't know a whole lot, but this pretty software, you, know, you can look at it and it'll tell you exactly what's going on. So if it's not there in their mind, it doesn't, you know, it's not there. Um, you can hide your HFC IP address. You can't hide the CPE uh, IP address, which CPE is the, the IP address on your computer that you're actually being assigned. And Customer, the reason is... Uh, CPE yeah. is a customer premise equipment. Yep. yep. Stand for. Yep, on, uh, on your computer. And you have to think, though, you, well, how could you hide that? I mean, if you're wanting to actually, you know, send and receive data, you know, that IP address needs to be out there. And you can hide the reported software version, um, system OID. And these and other settings can be hard coded into or set by firmware, uh, you know, for the desired result. And those actually give the commands right under there, like I said, so you can download this and actually uh, do it at home. Uh, some field results uh, have a lot of anonymous people that have said, you know, they've had high success rates with zero signs of detection. I know Durandal, who was uh, originally going to be here, he has a machine on a business configuration and he's had that thing online I think maybe a year and like three months and it's seeding torrents and he wanted that information to be out but he didn't really want to be here in person saying that <laughs> he, he just said you know if they uh, if they want to try to find me you know they can but I'm not going to get up there and make it any easier for them <laughs> so uh, there's of course like the pictures you saw of all the modems hooked up to the Sunfire server um, there's some people have eight or more modems hooked up. I, mean, I don't know why you need that many, but I mean, you know, maybe Ted Stevens does. <laughs> like, he wants a series of tubes. <laughs> so uh, um, now one thing, important thing, in all these scenarios, uh, the individuals are actually paying for service. They do have, you know, an account that they're paying for. They just, you know, hey, splice the, you know, coax line and add some more modems. Um, so then let's go from there, let's go on and get on to cloning, which you don't have to do on Comcast. But some ISPs, you know, you do have to use cloning. If you, you know, if you don't figure out the way to bypass, you know, how they're trying to restrict your internet, then cloning is a pretty easy way to get an actual, you know, look like you're a valid uh, user. So basic cloning is just taking an HFC MAC address and basically, you know, you go in the firmware and you just change your MAC to that to match that MAC. Um, due to the broadcast nature of the network. You have to use an HFC MAC on a uh, cable modem termination system other than yours. Reason, you know, you can't have two, com uh, you know, two modems right there talking to the same CMTS saying, hey, I'm this guy, and the other guy saying, yeah, well, this is, you know, that MAC address is mine also. I mean, that doesn't work. 
That's kind of uh, basic networking. Um, the method, sorry, this method allows you to uh, force any config file, but uh, it does associate you with that other person's account. So that's uh, kind of the downside versus the, the total anonymity is you're actually, you are tied to an account, it's just not yours. One of the cool things about uh, Comcast and Charter and some of the other American ISPs is you can clone a MAC address from uh, pretty much any state in the, in the USA that's uh, on their network. I mean, imagine California, you can clone a MAC from New York and it'll work. Yeah, Comcast just seems to have it set up for their one big network. So there's a little nice diagram to, in case anyone, you know, is like, hey, I don't know what, what he means by CMTS. Basically saying, okay, so it's a, you know, neighborhood over here on node three. Uh, you're taking their MAC address and you clone it on node one. You guys are on different CMTSs, so it works. And obtaining information for cloning, people are like, okay, well, if they're not, you know, right there where I can just uh, sniff the traffic, then how am I supposed to get this information? Well, if you didn't already know, of course, like everything, it's traded privately on forums, IRC, and, you know, whatever other mediums people use to communicate. Um, finding HFC MAC addresses on your node uh, can be found just by sniffing the uh, DHCP packets that are sent from the CMTS to the modems. So you can, you know, hook a modem up, run Wireshark, and uh, easily, you know, get a list of that, and you could go trade it with someone else in a, you know, on a different uh, node, different CMTS. There's also programs called, uh, there's one called Coax the, from TCNISO and DHCP Force will do that, and the other method is uh, SMMP scanning, but it only works on uh, certain ISPs. So yeah, certain well. ISPs, you can actually uh, get HFC Max, you know, farther away with that. And then we have the exact clones, or some people call them a perfect clone, which are actually taking all the identifying information from uh, the modem, the HFC MAC, the Ether MAC, the USB MAC, serial, and all the BPI plus certificates. And then you're, you know, you're actually basically taking everything from that modem and putting it on another modem. And then you, know, you have a perfect clone that way. Um, exact clones are usually non-provisioned modems. Uh, the basically just to be able to pass an initial check because uh, dev delay is going to get into a little bit more but with BPI plus uh, there starts to be some some problems where if you just change your Mac and you don't have a certificate that matches it then your modem you know it fails the BPI plus check but uh, basically this is saying you know in order to bypass that you can make these perfect clones and then getting into it more everyone always says well you know how anonymous are you I mean there has to be, you know, they be able to find something out. Well, I mean, sure, they can pinpoint a modem, but not to an exact location. They can get it to the node in question where the modem is, which is generally, you know, a neighborhood or a few neighborhoods. And really that's not, in my mind, that's really not accurate enough. I, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, but I would say I don't think it'd be really accurate enough to get a conviction if somebody was doing something bad on that, on that network. They can trace it as far as your upstream node, which is usually 100 to 200 modems, and um, only way to really catch someone is to go and unplug every single wire on that on that uh, HFC plant. Yeah, that's what I'm going to. Yeah, the ISPs I know some of them will pull for poor signal levels, so um, you know you can turning off SNMP if you have that off, they're not actually going to be you know getting those signal levels because your modem's not going to be responding. But let's say you want to leave it on, let it respond. Well, uh, you can use like a drop amp from Motorola if you want to put like, let's say you want eight modems online and you want them all to have good signal levels. Well, then you can do that. Um, there's, we gave a little bit of information on what your downstream and upstream should be. So if you're doing this and you're like, well, are my signal levels good or are they bad? Well, there they are for you. Um, a lot of ISPs do perform routine audits on lines uh, saying that if you're not paying for service, let's say you don't pay for it at all. You just go out there, climb the pole and hook it up. Or if you're in an apartment complex, you know, you pick the lock on the box and, you know, okay. Or bribe the maintenance, man. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Works pretty well. So I know uh, a lot of ISPs use colored tags to say what kind of service they have. So, hey, you know, you cut those off and, you know, there's not a whole lot of information for them. They're like, oh, man, we got to trace this stuff and, you know, figure out what account it is, what it's supposed to have. Um, also, there's going to be uh, some ISPs have adopted and implemented at a cost uh, ROC, uh, regional operational centers which actually uh, look like they're sit in front of the CMTS and, and maintain a, a list of customer MAC addresses and uh, dev delay. I don't know, you're gonna touch on that a little bit more. Basically the ROC just sits on front of the CMTS. They're all independently connected to each other and uh, it's just a way for them to do uh, better clone detection so they can basically say, 
uh, hey, these are all the Macs that have registered with this CMTS. Uh, and another rock will say, well, this one just registered over here, and uh, now we can just go ahead and try to disconnect this guy because it's obviously been identified as a clone. It's pretty straightforward, but um, not a lot of ISPs are using it. Um, and really, uh, honestly, American ISPs are really lax with any security measures. Most security measures we've seen being implemented are uh, in Canada. So um, I don't know why that is exactly, but it's... There's a lot higher uh, penetration rate of, of hacked modems in Canada than in America sure, for so whatever reason. Until after this speech. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, we, we work with some of the um, suppliers. We work with all the um, uh, big American cable companies. And what the owners have told me is that the American cable companies aren't very concerned about it right now because there's so few hacked modems sure. out there and it's not really costing them anything, so they just kind of ignore us. And That's uh, some that yeah. kind of touch on... Um, I'm with Cirque, and one of the things before this speech, you know, was to be given was, hey, you know, we have to contact these guys. So you contact the ISPs, they literally just don't care. I mean, they're like, well, we're not losing that much money, you know, that's a lot of cost to try to fix that stuff. I mean, I don't think they really want, you know, wanted me to talk, but they, <laughs> they're not willing to do anything to fix the problem, so. The cost to enforce, enforce the security measures is not worth um, what it would save them for, as well as, as well as convenience. They lose a lot of convenience by changing their network to do this sort of thing uh, to stop it. So that's another factor to, you know, sure. be discussed. And uh, to just move on with the throwing up a red flag, you know, if you don't use the, the techniques that we've discussed on remaining anonymous, you know, hey, that's going to help throw up a red flag. I listed excessive torrenting because I would uh, believe that they would notice that. Now, Durandal, like I said, in his, uh, you know, using his, his server and doing torrenting has said, hey, nothing, you know, you know, nothing's happened, nobody showed up. Uh, so, you know, in my mind, I, I think that will throw up a flag. But apparently he's, uh, you know, he's using the techniques that are in this speech and he, you know, year and three months, you know, nobody's showing up. Now maybe someone will show up tomorrow now that the speech has been given, but um, <laughs> right now it, it looks good. FTP web servers, I said, you know, hosting, where is porn, uh, things like that. I, I figure heavily used services would, you know, throw up a red flag. Using uh, clone MAC addresses without discretion, um, committing uh, fraud crimes, etc. It, it just uh, seems like if certain MAC addresses, if you're tied to an account and the account's being looked into, then it, that seems like it would throw up a red flag. Like, hey, who's this guy? Oh, wait, why is he, you know why is he on these two different CMTSs? Um, splitting the connection too many times, of course, will weaken the signal. And if you don't have SNMP uh, turned off, then that will cause text to come out and look like, hey, why is this signal so low? Comcast doesn't actually pull for poor signals, but one uh, example, Tom, Tom Char Warner. Charter Communications yeah. pulls for um, for poor signals, and if you have a, a signal that's out of spec, they'll, they'll send a tech out to your house to check on it. And uh, Yeah, same thing as a Time Warner. If you look at the description on the speech, there's a Time Warner network guy that was willing to give out, you know, pretty much all the ways they use to try to detect theft of service, and that's where, where that's coming from. Uh, so some precautions, of course. Don't transfer personal information, unencrypted ever <laughs> keep an eye out for the party van or cable technicians. Um, had a pretty, I don't know if anybody like, looks at 4chan, I had a little picture of a van with Peta Bear and all that stuff in it, but decided not to, <laughs> not to put that in. Um, of course, pay for service on one of your modems, and you have a bunch of other ones hooked up. If you're paying for service, uh, the ISPs seem pretty content. They don't really seem to, to really care. I mean, I, it's kind of a gray area with the law in America, yeah. some of this stuff. I mean, you're paying for service, and so that it seems like they don't really want to mess with you. Uh, of course, be careful, like we said already, with uh, which HFC MAC addresses you clone. And if you are stealing service, completely stealing service, you know, remove those line identifiers. So then it gives them a harder time to actually figure out, you know, where you're at. Like if you're at an apartment complex and all these, you know, coax lines are running through concrete and everything else, well, you're going to make their job a lot harder if you remove that little identifier and make them have to figure out where that, you know, where that actually goes to. And then, unfortunately, like I said, because the, the non-disclosure, I can't get into too much detail about the response that was given at the showcase. Um, there's Ron Buskey, one of the uh, chief security architects at Motorola, right there watching my speech there. But the, the big thing they were concerned about that I'm you know, able to say was the, uh, the lack of privacy, that the, you know, your connection is actually only encrypted with 56-bit uh, deaths, not triple deaths, just single deaths. 
So I know Guy Martin has a speech uh, later tonight about sniffing DOCSIS traffic, and it's unencrypted DOCSIS traffic, but if you think about it, well, how secure is 56-bit DES? So that, you know, that's, that's all that's protecting you, if, if they even have it turned on. In some cases, like with Charter, they don't have it turned Pretty on. Pretty much every ISP in America, most of the world, has BPI or BPI Plus enabled. Uh, Charter is the only major ISP in America that doesn't use BPI for whatever reason. Uh, they use it for their uh, VOIP service, but cable modems, uh, you can sniff your neighbor's traffic with Wireshark, and this technology's been around since, you know, 1998 or so, and they just have not implemented it for whatever reason. Sure, and with that, I'd like to uh, have Bite My Taco come up here and uh, go on with the speech. This all, this all started around 2002. A guy named Duringel runs a TCN ISO. Um, figured out that uh, w when you uh, get a, a modem from your cable company, they can upgrade the firmware as soon as you plug it in. Uh, he figured out that you can um, hook it up to your Ethernet and, and force a firmware update to whatever firmware you want. And that's how they started with the old uh, SB4200 models, uh, mo the old Motorola surfboards. Um, and they moved on to 5100s and, and whatnot. But the way it all starts is uh, this orange modem here is a Motorola Fat Rate Diagnostic Modem. They're not available to the public. They're only leased to ISPs. Um, they have shelled firmware on them, which has some of them have Telenet. They have a little headphone port on the back that goes through a serial cable, and you get full shell access to the modem. And, and all ha these hacked firmwares are based on shelled firmware that comes off of these orange modems here. And we take them and modify them and add the you know our GUI with the features to you know, make stuff easy to do, like change your MAC address, disable BPI, et cetera. Um, uh, it started out with the old uh, original Sigma, ran on the old SB4100 and 4200s. Um, and th the scene pretty much stayed underground until 2006. Duringo released a book called Hacking the Cable Modem. And you can go buy it at Barnes & Noble. And after that, it, it kind of went a little more mainstream. But, but before that, it was... Uh, <laughs> he said the, uh, they have the book for sale here, apparently. Um, but yeah, the, the scene was underground for about four years, and then he released his book, and you know all the ISPs have read it, and you know it just got a lot more people in, into the uh, into the scene. But um, a couple years ago, they released Sigma X for the SP5100, one of the best firmwares ever. Um, uh, and then around uh, October 2006, um, PCNSO has a forum where you, you know, discuss the information that you need to get on your ISP. It wasn't very good, so um, my, my partner, uh, his name is s &P Rape. He started uh, surfboardhacker.net um, you know, for people to come and discuss information freely. And um, we're basically, we were reselling uh, TCNISO's firmware for a while. They created Sigma X2. Uh, Sigma X was DOCSIS 1.0 only. Um, Uh, okay, diagnostic factory firmware. Um, basically, you can do everything you want to, to hack a modem with it uh, if you know what you're doing, but everything's command line, either through Telnet or the, um, the serial interface, through you know, hyper terminal or GTK term. Um, but the, the shell firmware is not available to you know, end users. You have to get it from, through Motorola. Um, Duringle's got some special connection with them where he gets all this stuff uh, and doesn't like to share it with the public. And there's no GUI for this where you can make changes, and, that, and that's what makes it easy. Um, okay. Sigma X2, um, very easy to use, got a lot of features. You know, it's just based on the um, SP5100 uh, shelled firmware, DOCSIS 2.0. Uh, Duringle didn't actually code. He has a, a team of coders who, who did this for him. Um, and he charges $20 for a license to use um, Sigma firmware. And uh, supposedly there's some backdoors in there that he, he created to um, basically sell to the ISPs if they wanted to shut down all the hack modems. He was going to sell out uh, his own firmware. So far this but, hasn't been confirmed. <laughs> yeah, we, we haven't found any. We just assembled it and can't find anything. But he, he claims there's backdoors in there for all kinds of stuff. Or backdoors for uh, destroying and, your firmware flash. Um, you know, like I said, Sigma X is, is DOCSIS 1.0 only, so it doesn't work on every ISP, but it, it was very stable. Um, Sigma X2 has a bug where uh, these modems only have 8 megs of RAM, 
And, and when you start torrenting and you get too many connections open, too many peers, the modem will actually crash and reboot because it runs out of memory, has a, a buffer overflow. Um, the new Sigma X2 has kind of fixed that, and then uh, Surfboard Hacker's new firmware for the uh, SP5101 um, doesn't crash. But, um, the, uh, also, a guy uh, from Europe named Tom created something recently called SP5100 Mod. Uh, the interface looks kind of like DDWR, uh, DDWRT, very easy to use, same features, and it's free. Um, also based on the same Motorola diagnostic firmware, um, but there's, you know, there's a few bugs and, and it, there's so many features that it can be confusing. And a few months ago, um, we came across the source for these little orange beauties right here, and we got the, um, the SP5101 shell firmware, which we've been looking for for a very long time. And um, found a developer, and he created the firmware called Hacksorware, and it was built for the SP5101, but it basically runs on, on any modem with a Broadcom BCM3349 uh, chipset, an RCA DCM425, the Ambit uh, 250. Um, there's some other ones that will run on as well, the uh, WebStar DVC 2100 R2. Um, it's got a TFTP enforced bypass. Um, it's got a, a built-in TFTP server where you can store your configuration file of choice in the flash and instead of having to pull it off your ISP TFTP or your computer, it, it just it boots the modems and, and pulls the config from the flash. It's, it's a pretty cool feature. Um, you can set a static HFC IP subnet and gateway instead of using the one that the ISP assigns you. You can spoof the, the vendor, the model, the firmware version. You can change the SNMP ports so the um, ISP really can't. Uh, Doxis is completely managed by SNMP. Um, and if you, you change the SNMP port, the standard port's 161 and 162 for traps. And if you change it, the, your modem won't respond to the ISP trying to contact it and they really can't get any information from it. Um, and of course, when we, we add to the firmware a GUI that makes it easy to use, um, we added the web shell that it works kind of like Telnet. Um, it's got very detailed diagnostic output. Um, it's got username and password. You can upgrade the firmware from the web interface, um, back up your flash and your, your non-volatile settings. Your non-volatile settings store your, your tuner settings, you know, uh, your frequency, um, other stuff like that. And he also put a feature in to skip the modem config checks. Um, in every config, there's a, um, an MD5 hash at the bottom um, that the CMTS verifies to make sure the config. Uh, back in the day, you could edit the config to, to have any speed you want, and that hasn't worked for a very long time. And uh, the skip modem configs check basically ignores the MD5 hash, so you can use an edited config. But that only works if the CMTS is not properly configured. It doesn't work in America. There's some ISPs in Europe uh, where it works. but. Uh, we're working on a way to basically ignore the CMTS controls where you have access. We're basically trying to make it so you can ignore the CMTS telling the modem, no, you can't have access, and, and, and just force it. Um, yeah, basically, uh, you know, this all started with, with the uh, TC and ISO. Many thanks to Duringle for, you know, making this possible for everyone. And, um, you know, Surfboard Hacker is taking it to the next level. We've got the 5101 firmware out that runs on all these different modems, and um, we're Got a 5102 we're working on, and um, next step is DOCSIS 3.0. And uh, Duringo is actually working right now on porting um, Sigma X2 to the uh, 5101, but that's not out yet. And then uh, it's uh, Dev Delay's turn to talk about hardware. Sure. Hey guys. Uh, Thanks for coming out. Um, I just want to cover basically uh, stuff listed here. Um, I don't know if uh, all you guys can read that, but uh, basically, I'm going to cover some hardware. I'm going to cover some uh, of the encryption authentication measures that the modem uses. Um, why is this possible and who's at fault? Um, I've got kind of uh, perspectives and ob objectives here just to make the top topic, you know, a little more honest because, uh, you know, it's a little illegal, some of the stuff we're talking about here. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the future and uh, some problems and so some solutions. Um, why should you guys listen to me? Um, I'm cool. <laughs> I do uh, IT and I IS consultant work. Um, I'm actively pursuing CISSP, although I'm 
hearing that that's uh, null and void soon with uh, the PI requirement. Kind of lame. Um, an active member of uh, Surfboard Hacker and an admin there. I also assisted uh, Rajko Hacker, the uh, Serbian prodigy on development design, debugging, testing of the uh, latest hackerware firmware, which was uh, financially backed by Byte My Taco. This kid is uh, 17 years old, and he knows uh, every programming language known to man. <laughs> He's, IQ's got to be about 200. And yeah. but, uh, Dev Delay here did most of the testing and uh, made, made all this possible. Um, you know, spent a lot of hours and hard work on, on making it possible. So uh, anyway, uh, onto our objectives for honest discussions. Uh, basically, I just think it's important that we discuss that we should provide an open forum for users, hackers, professionals, and law enforcement to discuss that, you know, hacked modems exist. Uh, warrantless wiretaps are legal, I guess. And uh, these modems are used for anonymous, free, and fast internet. Uh, they're virtually undetectable. They can be used for evil. Uh, the other thing that's important, which basically is partly why this is possible, is understanding and evaluating the uh, Doxis, Doxis network as a viable telecommunications protocol. Um, essentially, part of this is possible because of the nature of the network, uh, security flaws in the network, and also best practices of the ISP. You know, um, a lot of it is due really to the fact that ISPs do not care and they do not configure their CMTS properly. Um, so that's really improper use and abuse by everyone. Most of their network admins are complete idiots. Yeah, to be quite I'd honest. Say. I mean, <laughs> the truth be told, they're morons. And uh, how can we make it better, both uh, from the ISP side or uh, from our side? And can we coexist? I don't even know if that's possible, but it seems to be working out so far for five years. Hey. Any, anybody in this room could configure a CMTS better than these uh, cable company <laughs> employees and, and stop, put a stop to it. But, you know. So what is a DOCSIS cable modem? Well, it's basically just a computer. Um, you've got a Broadcom chipset. Uh, either BCM 3348, 3349. Um, it's got a 200 megahertz processor, uh, RAM 16 bit, 8 megabytes of RAM. It can be upgraded. Uh, I actually haven't heard of anyone upgrading past 16 megabytes, but you can upgrade I don't it think to 32. Necessary. But the uh, the bootloader can only address 16 megs. And, right. And before the uh, the Sigma X2 uh, firmware was fixed to to stop the torrent crashing. We actually offered a memory upgrade of 16 megs that eliminated that problem, but now it's it's kind of obsolete with, with the hacks we're wearing the new X2 version, so don't crash. So uh, we've got a two megabyte flash ROM, and uh, all of them operate pretty much on a real-time operating system, which is either VXWorks or ECOS. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. All right, so uh, trust encryption, authentication. Basically, I'm just talking about BPI and BPI+. Plus. Um, BPI is just a method for encrypting traffic between the CMTS and the modem. Uh, it uses 56-bit DES, which is pretty weak. Uh, it's not even a problem to crack that. Um, a lot of ISPs don't even use it. Um, baseline Privacy Interface Plus is uh, basically implemented in DOCSIS 1.1. It's backwards compatible, meaning it uses still encryption between the CMTS and the CM, but it adds X509. Uh, digital certificates, which basically is used for authentication between the modem and the CMTS, basically proving your identity. Uh, that's really what it comes down to. Um, Motorola calls this the trust ring. I've heard other companies call it the web of trust. Um, these are stored in the non-vol settings of the modem. Um, they contain a public, private, root key, a CM, and a CA certificate. Uh, the CA certificate is a manufacturer certificate. Um, an ISP can actually grab uh, from Cable Labs. They can, you know, require uh, or ask buy, sorry, a uh, CA certificate for themselves, and then issue their own certificates for all of their modems. Um, the one important thing too is that uh, on CMTSs, by default, they actually accept self-signed certificates. So this is really important because we essentially can create our own certificates and then uh, tell the CMTS, hey, I am who I say I am, even though the MAC is uh, not provisioned at all. Um, so why is hacking cable modems possible, and who's to blame? Um, I basically look at blame for three people, the manufacturers, the developers, and administrators. 
And really, for the manufacturers, there's no physical security at all. Um, that's probably the most important thing there. Uh, developers, uh, initial hacks that involved with cable modems uh, were using factory modes. Um, and really, you can use SNMP to enable a factory mode. Hey, and okay. one sec. I just wanted to add real quick, um, Motorola, one thing that can be said is uh, Ron Buskey actually did write a, a paper on secure JTAG, but when Motorola wanted to use that, um, the ISPs, you know, they didn't really want to pay the extra money that it would cost to, to have that on the modems. So I do know it is the, yeah, the developers did, it is insecure, but they did have a solution that the ISPs didn't want to use. Right. So, and then we can also blame the ISPs because they don't want to spend the money. It's too inconvenient for them. Um, they improperly config their CMTS. And there's also flaws that are in the iOS for the CMTS. Another one of the things with, with the ISPs is there's uh, still millions of DOCSIS 1.0 modems out in the field, and, and the cost to replace them all with 1.1 and 2.0 modems is sometimes not worth the benefit to them. So they, they can't really enforce security when there's still that many 1.0 modems out there in the field have to replace. And also, uh, I think it's important to discuss the uh, perspectives here, you know, coming from customer, your customer, you hate your ISP, all right? Just by default, you probably do. <laughs> you, want <laughs> you want them to, you know, protect and respect your privacy, you want quality service, and uh, you want them to stop charging when it doesn't work right. Um, hackers say, hey, you might expect this to happen because we can do it. Um, and we demand anonymous internet access, and if we can find a way to do it, we'll do it. Um, and it seems like they make it so easy just for the fact that they don't care or they don't do it right. Um, that's another reason why it happens, and it's not our fault. <laughs> and even when they do try to configure everything properly, they're still not going to stop it. Um, ISPs, I think I basically covered that. You know, They don't want you to have unlimited bandwidth. Uh, they lie about being secure or being properly configured. They cut corners. Uh, and Unofficial bandwidth caps. Yeah, they want to stop your torrents, interfere with that sort of thing. All right. And uh, your information could be sold. So that's just one reason why we want to be an anonymous. All right, next I'm going to talk about uh, disassembling the firmware. Basically, there's three types of firmware. Assigned and compressed, compressed binary image, and RAM dump images. RAM dump images are basically stored in the RAM in the last four megabytes. Uh, a dump image can be loaded into IDA Pro for reversing or manipulation. And uh, current firmwares use VXWorks or ECOS. Both are coded in MIPS. It's really fun. Uh, here's the anatomy of the flash contents, just so you guys can get an idea of what this two megabyte dump actually looks like. There's a bootloader here, 32K. Um, there's also, in some modems, they use another 32K to store settings for that bootloader. Uh, the next 960K is the first firmware image. The next 960K is another image. Basically, the reason there's two is so that the ISP can upgrade uh, you know, while the existing firmware is running. Uh, the next is dynamic volume. This uh, basically stores uh, logs and that sort of thing. So uh, reverse and disassemble tools. Uh, you've got an unsigned firmware image. So that's basically what you need. Uh, if it's signed, you can actually remove the signed uh, header from it. And then uh, you can use LZMA to basically uh, decompress that into a dump. There's other tools that people have made. Next, you're going to need your uh, favorite hex editor. Um, you're going to need IDA Pro Advance, your favorite compiler, um, I know Rajko, he actually wrote his own specifically to build hackerware. You're also going to need a serial console cable just so you can get debug output from the fat shell or the shelled factory firmware. And uh, a lot of time and patience because it takes a long time to do this stuff. All right, uh, next I want to talk about the future. Future, basically, so far, you know, we haven't really seen any interrupts with ISPs making changes. Um, so what you can expect is better firmware, uh, better firmware to stop, prevent checks uh, that they might implement. Uh, the other thing that we have seen basically in Canada is ISP lockdowns. Um, you know, they do, they are able to lock this stuff down to a certain point, 
um, and they give up, you know, the expense of that, and also they give up, uh, you know, basically their convenience of being able to monitor the network. Um, and this is pretty much due to Craigslist. It's full of people trying to sell super modems, right? Three hundred dollars. People, people were selling illegally uh, pre-cloned <laughs> modems on Craigslist in Canada, and uh, Rogers and Shaw control about ninety percent of the Canadian market, and they both have started enforcing BPI plus. So everybody with a hat modem got knocked offline unless they really know what they're doing and can clone certs and all that good stuff. And uh, next thing we're going to start seeing soon, maybe, um, and is Docs 3.0. Although I've heard Comcast say, you know, we're going to have DOCSIS 3.0, really all they've been doing is uh, testing DOCSIS 2.0, which just involves uh, channel bonding, which they just take two or more downstream and upstream signals, bond them together in order to get faster speeds. Charter and Cablevision also announced in the past uh, recently that they're rolling out 3.0 this year and, and following Comcast. The other thing involved with DOCSIS 3.0 is uh, advanced class of service mappings, which basically you can stop like... Uh, you know, hey, I want to grab this config, force this speed, and it tells you no. So really you're kind of stuck at a speed that is assigned specifically to that Mac. And then also uh, maybe in the future we'll see purposely designed anonymous networks. Uh, that would be a perfect world, but who knows if we'll ever see it. Uh, some problems we're seeing too is uh, BPI plus. And uh, I'm actually running out of time, guys, so. Um, like I said, we can use self-signed certificates with BPI plus. We can also reverse the BPI manager, which could be a possibility in the future. And uh, you know, we talked about ROC, which is advanced clone detection. Um, and like I also said, uh, situation is really that the more that they try to lock it down, the less con convenient it is for them. So uh, with that said, um, we're going to have a question and answer session if you guys want to attend. Um, we're going to be giving out some swag and that sort of thing. And if you guys want to get more in depth, uh, I can talk for hours. Yeah, we've got. Um, if you have, a, if you're on Motorola modem or modem with a JTAG port, you can uh, mod it yourself with a JTAG cable. If you got one of these, something like this, you uh, use um, a serial cable or a USB serial cable to flash it. Uh, pretty much any modem with a Broadcom chipset can be modified, and we'll talk about more of that in the Q and A. We've got some free Surfboard Hacker and Soldier X T-shirts to give out. And, answer your questions about how to mod your own modem. Hey guys, thanks for coming.